we have brought together the key stakeholders to share best practices for veterans to effectively articulate the value proposition and assisting in giving them the tools available to position themselves for success. Um, this afternoon, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Joe Mella, who's our moderator this afternoon. Uh, Joe Mella is the chief of staff and the controller He's the Chief of Staff of the Controllers Department at Goldman Sachs. His responsibilities include managing all people-related initiatives, which includes recruitment, training, diversity, and communications. In addition, Joe manages several strategic department projects and initiatives and has oversight responsibility for the CFO function for all the finance division globally. In additionally, Joe has leadership roles on several national advisory boards, including Alpha, Haku, in which he's a vice chairman as well as advisory board member to St. John's University. Joe has earned his undergraduate degree in engineering from Rutgers University. Without further ado, Joe. Thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. And it is exciting for me to be here because for the firm of Goldman Sachs, we are the national sponsor for the initiative of veterans as well. And I do realize our friends from JP Morgan, um, and at events like this at Alpha, we could say the friends from JP Morgan, I don't know if I could say that at work, by the way, <laughs> are sponsoring today's event. Uh, and today's event is exciting from several aspects. Um, I'm about to announce our keynote speaker um, that he's gonna say a few kind words about um, the process and uh, his experiences. Uh, we have some distinguished guests here and panelists that I'm um, gonna have them introduce themselves. I'm gonna have some questions uh, for them as well. And then we're gonna open it up to the audience as well. So you're gonna get an opportunity to ask some questions um, that's either gonna be helpful for you, helpful for perhaps your firms, or helpful to others that you may know in the space of hiring uh, military folks. So let me first go on to uh, do a quick intro of our keynote speaker. Um, like I said, uh, the, uh, the initiative today is sponsored by J.P. Morgan, and today I can say that's a good thing. Um, and more importantly, the keynote speaker has some boring information in his past. He's been a senator. Uh, he's been on a presidential cabinet member. Uh, he's been the mayor of uh, Orange County in Florida, 25 years uh, experience as a lawyer. Um, but what I'd like to say, more important, what I noticed in his bio, and you can read it as well at the documents in front of you, uh, he's board member for the Marriott Vacation Club. And since I am a member of the Marriott Vacation Club, <laughs> I have a lot to chat with him a little later about, about my experiences as a vacation owner. And without further ado, let me introduce you to Mel Martinez. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Listen, I'm happy to help you with extra points anytime. And if you want to buy more weeks, I can also help you with that. Anyway, great to be with all of you today. Thank you very much. I am currently uh, vice, uh, I'm currently chairman for the Southeast and Latin America for J.P. Morgan Chase, and it's a real pleasure to be here as part of, of that group. Um, first of all, it's my first experience with Alpha, and I can't tell you just walking the halls here over the last half hour or so how impressed I am with all that, that goes on here. The energy in the hallway, is amazing, the uh, young people all around, the opportunities that I know are being fostered here is, is terrific. So let me commend all of you who are involved with Alpha. I'm also excited that uh, at Floridian, Charlie Garcia is gonna be your new uh, CEO. He's a terrific person and uh, I've known him for a long time. He, uh, he really is such a terrific person that he actually held a fundraiser for me at his home when I was running for the Senate. So that makes him a really terrific person. Uh, <laughs> We, we at J.P. Morgan uh, Chase are here with uh, all kinds of people uh, in this effort to uh, connect and recruit and, and get to know young people that are here. Our Adelante Affinity Group is also here in full force. And it's really exciting to see all that goes on at uh, your, your conference. And so I think it's really uh, commendable and I, I just uh, have discovered a new organization that I will try to stay connected with. We're talking today about veterans, and it's a topic that I feel deeply and strongly about, and that, that was uh, forged as a result of my government service. Not only as a member of the United States Senate and the cabinet of the president, I was in the president's cabinet during the days of 9-11 and all that followed from there, but also uh, as a member of the Armed Services Committee of the Senate, I got an opportunity to work with the leadership of our armed services and also to travel to places where our people serve traveling to Afghanistan, to Iraq, to forward operating bases where our people are deployed 
in these very, very difficult circumstances, very difficult parts of the world, with incredible risk and danger, is not only uh, something for which we will never be able to do enough to thank the men and women who have done this service, but also to always keep in mind their families and the sacrifices that they have made so that we can be, remain safe, so we can remain free. Uh, so, you know, the important work of transitioning all of these folks who have served with such distinction and honor back to civilian life is what this is about. And so um, about a million veterans will be coming out of the workforce. I don't want to steal the thunder of your panel and the discussion that they will have, but this is a significant challenge for our country. So, uh, you know, over the next several years, we're going to see thousands upon thousands of veterans that are going to be wanting to enter the workforce. And that transition is not like a transition for a 22-year-old that's graduating from college and all they have to transition of is to change their hours and not be up until 3 every night and, and you know, and, and, and get up at 10. So that's a transition, but nothing like what our veterans face because of what they've been through, the experiences they've had, the things that have occurred. You know, you have to do nothing more than visit Walter Reed, as I did, uh, now closed, but Bethesda, and, and see that our wounded warriors and what they have to overcome to get back into a normal life and to get back to their families and to be in productive once again. So J.P. Morgan Chase, I'm delighted to say, began an initiative uh, about three years ago to begin to work on this problem in an earnest sort of way. I know Goldman is doing as well. And what we've done is come together in a partnership to try to uh, place 100,000 veterans in jobs. That partnership, which has come together with about 50 uh, of the major companies in our country, uh, have come together, a lot of them in the financial services arena, to come together and say, we're going to now up that to 200,000. The need is so great. And frankly, what we have found is that we, in that, in that capacity, can now see the benefits of hiring veterans, the, the, the maturity, the skills, uh, the seriousness of purpose that they bring to the workforce is really unparalleled and fantastic. We have hired over 7,000 veterans. We're working at a couple of other fronts. We also understand the need for these veterans to get an education, to begin a, a training. Now, many of them have tremendous training and opportunities. They just need to be channeled into what the private sector needs. And so the needs of the military and those of the private sector are not always the same, but they're very compatible. So allowing them to have an opportunity for an educational experience is really a tremendous and important part of that. Something that I you know, used to be housing secretary, so I'm close to the whole issue of housing. And I love the idea that we also have been participating in this way uh, over um, uh, 700 houses completely refurbished have been donated through our affiliate uh, not-for-profit organizations by Chase Mortgage to uh, deserving veteran families. And these homes are given to them free of any, uh, any mortgage, any charge of any kind. And it's a terrific thing. Handing a key to a veteran and his family or her family uh, as they walk into their home for the first time and have an opportunity to re begin their lives once again is an experience that, frankly, is, is hard to forget. And so that is what we're doing at J.P. Morgan Chase. It's what the rest of America needs to do in an even more robust way because the numbers are going to overwhelm what we're doing. So hiring veterans, transitioning them to the private sector is something that uh, all of us need to focus on and be about. And let me just close, because I know you have an excellent panel about to speak to you. Uh, the number of young people here has really impressed me, and I'm delighted to have uh, this opportunity to just say a couple of words to you. First and foremost, you live in a great country with great opportunities. You've been given a privilege of a tremendous education. That opportunity, and you as, as Latino and Hispanic uh, uh, future leaders in our financial services world, you, you have great opportunities ahead of you. It is by the fact that you're here, that you've chosen to come and be here out of your own pocket to participate in these events, to try to be about getting a job. That tells me that all of you who are here are going to be successful in one way or the other because you have taken the initiative to be here. So keep that kind of enthusiasm and keep that, time, that kind of focus and you'll be very successful in all that you do in life. It takes a lot of hard work. It takes a lot of preparation. You combine the two and it's amazing how lucky you can get. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mel, for that. And I'd like to give another applause to J.P. Morgan for the terrific work that they're doing with veterans. So
So now for the, uh, the bread and butter piece of uh, the event. I have some uh, four distinguished panelists here, and rather than me go through their bios up here, I'm going to have them introduce themselves, and there's some further details in the documents uh, that are on your chairs as well. Uh, so with that, let me hand it over to the panelists for them to introduce themselves. Great. Thanks, John. Hi, uh, welcome, and uh, for Steve Mayer from Moody's Corporation. So first off, thank you very much to uh, all the folks at Alpha and for everyone here for attending and for having the opportunity to come down and speak a little bit about what we're doing at, at Moody's Corporation. So by way of background, um, I uh, went to the military academy, United States Military Academy at West Point, graduated in 99, served five years on active duty as an artillery officer in, uh, in Germany, uh, ultimately attained the rank of captain before separating after my five years, did a short stint in, uh, in Kosovo in 2002, uh, separated out of the Army in 2004. Still have quite a few friends, though, that are, that are serving to this day. And I know a lot of folks that, uh, that have been through numerous, numerous deployments over the last decade plus. Um, so I left the service in 04, went on to graduate school, and, uh, and then moved down to New York, work in the finance industry uh, starting in 2006, and that's what I've been doing since. Worked in investment bank for a couple of years, um, and now I'm at Moody's for the last year and a half. So we, um, we at Moody's are somewhat new in our uh, in, our, in our stages of getting our veterans initiative going. Uh, it was myself and a group of other, a couple of other veterans uh, that started the effort a little over a year ago. So I joined Moody's the beginning of 2013 and a couple of months after I joined, we started this effort. Uh, we got the, our veterans ERG employee resource group up and running uh, June of last year. So it's just a little over a year, but we've done actually quite a bit in that, in that period of time. And we've had started on a couple of different initiatives to uh, hopefully increase the roles of military folks at Moody's because um, everyone, uh, agrees that this is an issue. Um, you know, Senator Martinez touched on it. There's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of returning soldiers, sa sailors, and airmen, uh, and Marines that are going to be coming back, uh, that are coming back, and, and that it, that trend is not going to stop over the years to come. And so I think it's incumbent on uh, all of us collectively, uh, corporate, uh, private sector, public sector, and otherwise, to do what we can uh, to help integrate these folks. So I look forward to sharing my thoughts with you all. Thank you, Stephen. Hi everyone, John Sanchez um, with PNC Bank, um, former Navy guy, sitting next to an Army guy here, sitting next to two Army guys here. Uh, went to the Naval Academy, graduated class of 1995. Uh, after the, I graduated, went on to be a Navy SEAL, got to serve six years overseas, led multiple missions uh, in the Middle East. I was assigned to SEAL Team 3. Had a wonderful time, wonderful career, um, enjoyed it, got out, went straight into the financial, financial services industry. Started with Smith Barney as a, as a financial advisor, and then I switched over to banking a couple years ago into PNC, and now I'm with the team uh, PNC. I handle high net worth side of wealth management. Um, very, the PNC's uh, employee business resource group, a little farther along, um, um, just to give a little bit more perspective, we uh, have about 700 members. We've been working really, really hard. We feel very fortunate that uh, we just won the Freedom Award um, which is the highest award given to any company uh, that supports veterans. So I'm very, very proud of that initiative and what we've been able to do and can help maybe in the panel discussion talk about how that was set up and how our internal organization and structure is helped set up. Um, people look at veterans and, and it's very nice to say thank you for your service. Uh, I'd, I'd like to extend that thank you to all you guys for, for really being here and helping veterans get back and serve because um, there's a great core of individuals out there that are seeking you. So thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for your interest in attending this panel. Uh, obviously, it's something dear to the panelists here and also the J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs who supported this. Uh, my introduction to the military was through the United States Air Force. Uh, I went in there as an enlisted and I was in the Strategic Air Command, uh, Loring Air Force Base. Since, this, since then, it has been closed with uh, base reduction, but we had a critical mission which was obviously uh, to play a critical role when uh, the Soviet Union was in existence and insurance we had uh, protection from their uh, TU-95 bombers. Uh, very interesting. However, uh, I felt that I wanted to do something more. Uh, I wanted to do something that, you know, that required more teamwork and I moved over to the Army. Um, at that point, I went with the 104th Long Range Surveillance. Uh, basically, these are units deployed behind what we refer to as FIBA. Uh, uh, forward enemy battle areas, which are differently deployed in the back, and it's just to collect intelligence and targets of opportunity. Um, I really enjoyed that, and then later on, went on to the 20th Special Forces as a uh, telegraph 
radial, uh, normally called Sparky or Marbell, ensuring we had communications with the forward bases and so forth. Uh, during the Air Force, I did get my uh, degree. I noticed that really, you know, what you folks have learned, which is uh, the, mo the, the vehicle for mobility is education. And the military is a microcosm which, you know, similar to civilian, uh, you get rewarded for how much you know and how much you dedicate yourself. So for a lot of Latinos, that uh, military experience is a springboard to higher education where you are, and that's why I think we could do a lot of inroads working together. Uh, when I left the service, after the 20th Special Forces, I did my rotations of firms and companies and ultimately landed in J.P. Morgan. Um, as uh, Senator Martinez pointed out, in 2010 and then early 2011, we were part of the 100,000-man job uh, mission, something very dear to a lot of folks. And uh, uh, at the point, it was with J.P. Morgan Chase. We began a business resource group referred to as the VETS, which is an acronym for employees uh, or voice of employees that have served. Huge representation if you look in all areas, whether it's New York, Houston, Texas, Jacksonville, um, Columbus. We have many, many veterans, and part of our organization is not only to help in the transition, which is really, really a critical uh, situation for veterans. It's a whole different structure and experience coming to uh, for, from that organization to the private sector, and what we're trying to do is ease that and show them the ropes. Merrill, uh, excuse me, Chase has continued uh, providing that support, I, I'm going to give you some details, not only of our efforts to increase the 200,000 job mission, but also all the fundings we've done, special in the educational field, to ensure that they have the right tools and the infrastructures so that they can leave the service, have the right skill sets, and come over to the private sector, which eventually boils down to how our community will accept them and the productivity and the values that they'll bring as they're woven into the fabric of each of our lives and our towns and cities. Thank you for having us here. Thank you, George. Uh, Will Boss from uh, Comcast NBC Universal. And since I'm last here, I'm going to take a second to actually poll the audience just briefly and um, ask how many people out there are, are veterans? How many people have served in the, in the military? OK, looks like for those of you on TV, probably about six or seven. So thank you for your service. And a round of applause, please, for everyone that served. How about people who come from a military family? Father, or grandfather served in the military? Okay, much larger, approaches about 30 or 40 percent. So just making a connection between the folks in the audience and the panel and the, and the topic today. Uh, I'm also going to take a moment to uh, brag about some of the companies that I'm up here and have the pleasure of sitting on this panel with because I think the one thing that uh, I find unique about this space is that it doesn't matter what company that you work for, even if you compete in the same industry, this topic uh, transcends the business competitive environment and really is uh, about being an American and support to this country and those who have served this country. Um, J.P. Morgan Chase, a true leader. Uh, we, Comcast NBC, are members of the 100,000 Hires Coalition. I know personally that I'm a more effective head of our military recruiting function because of some of the best practices and speakers and uh, opportunities that I've had to network there. Uh, we've worked with Goldman Sachs uh, on um, Wall Street uh, Warfighters, uh, which is an outstanding organization uh, supporting wounded warriors transitioning primarily into financial services, but um, big companies like Comcast also have finance and accounting, uh, and uh, so we're involved in that. PNC, familiar with your uh, efforts as well. Moody's less so, but look forward to your increased commitment to the space and uh, making a connection today and continuing to uh, to work going forward. Uh, it's, it's always rewarding to see the number of companies uh, in our country uh, that are standing up on this uh, important issue. Uh, so to talk about our company just for a second, Comcast NBC, um, consists of Comcast Cable and NBC Universal, over 130,000 uh, employees. And when it comes to veteran hiring, for us it really falls into three areas. It's honoring and supporting those who are currently serving. Uh, it's everything from phone banks for the USO when they're uh, offering the opportunity for families to, uh, to call home. It's over the holidays. Maybe some of you have seen troop greetings on demand where they go over into the desert or over into uh, deployed areas in Asia, and, and the um, troops have an opportunity to wish their family members uh, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, uh, et cetera. It's sponsoring things like the National Veterans Wheelchair Games uh, coming up uh, next week uh, in Philadelphia. It's about uh, hiring veterans, and that's a big uh, focus for us. Um, you know, we uh, have hired thousands since we've uh, 
really started this in earnest back in 2012, along with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation's Hiring Our Hero initiative. Uh, it's not new to us. Uh, we're founded by a veteran. Uh, Ralph Roberts was a U.S. Navy veteran in World War II. CEO of the Cable Division is a, uh, is a Navy vet. Uh, the president of Universal Pictures is a, is a proud former Marine. Uh, so we have a tradition of, of hiring military and supporting military. But of course, as this topic has become more significant, you know, with a million service members leaving over the next five years, we've, we've redoubled our efforts there as well. So we're focused on hiring and then lastly, supporting the veterans that we have. Not only the veterans by helping with their assimilation uh, into Comcast NBC, mentoring programs, specialized training, um, matching them with military friendly areas uh, in our company to work. Uh, but also supporting the, our reservists. And uh, me as a current serving U.S. Navy reservist, that's especially near and dear to my heart, whether it's pay differential matches for reservists called to active duty, uh, whether it's ensuring that they have a job when they come back at the same level and status that uh, maintains their career or is taking care of their families uh, when the uh, service member and reservist is deployed overseas. Uh, we've received comments like, uh, Comcast took better care of my family than the Army did when I was deployed. Actually, that's, that's rather, rather unfortunate comment uh, that I'd prefer not to hear, but if there's uh, room to support that family and we as a company step up to do it, then i um, proud of those efforts. Uh, and so just for my own personal service, I uh, did uh, almost nine years of uh, active duty in the U.S. Navy, a uh, variety of assignments at sea, uh, overseas, uh, I think the most significant thing that, that I was involved in, which really pales in comparison to what uh, the soldiers and Marines and airmen with the boots on the ground now in, in Afghanistan have done, but I uh, deployed to the Persian Gulf uh, off the coast of Iraq and forcing uh, no-fly zones as part of uh, Operation Southern Watch. Went into the reserves, just went over 23 years of total service, so I, I can't believe it. Um, and uh, I just had a drill weekend, so my hair cuts fresh. That's how you can always tell. <laughs> and uh, look forward to uh, participating in the panel and adding my thoughts to the distinguished uh, members of the group at this table. Thank you. Well, thank you, Will, and, and I'd like to have the audience give another applause for the fact that they serve our country as well. So one of the things I've personally learned even at my own firm is some of these military folks um, have brought a skill set that's often can't be found in some of the other folks that we look for in regards to hiring. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes it's difficult for them to uh, explain what those uh, skill sets are that they bring to the table. Uh, Stephen, let me ask you perhaps uh, your thoughts on how you could either help employers understand what those skill sets are or how you could help the military vet themselves explain what that skill set is that they can bring to the firm. Yeah, sure, happy to do that. No, that's, that, that is a big challenge. And, you know, I myself went through that when I was looking for civilian employment after I left uh, the military. And all I had known for the previous 10 years was, uh, was the Army. You know, I started as an 18-year-old um, at the academy and then, and then served after that. So um, it, it was a lot of unknowns. And, you know, there were, it, was, it, was, it was a pretty big uh, gap to try to bridge um, to get myself competitive with the other 27, 28-year-old um, MBA graduates that I was that were in my class that I was competing against, so that, it, it certainly was a challenge. Uh, fortunately, at my program, uh, there were there was a decent number of veterans. There was probably uh, ten percent, maybe less, a little less than that, uh, of the class was veterans, and so a lot of the uh, older students uh, really helped us, really helped mentor us, and teach us what we need to know. Uh, but you know, I, I think the biggest thing from the uh, military folks' perspective is is kind of. De, I say demystifying your resume and your background, right? And in, in the military, as in corporate America, and every, I guess, industry has this, but there's a lot of jargon, there's a lot of acronyms. Um, so the first step for a military person is to try to uh, make that resume understandable to someone that doesn't have a background in the military, that doesn't understand all the acronyms or all the jobs or what they might be, um, to try to put them in quote unquote layperson's terms. Uh, so it's a bit of a challenge, but working with other folks who are in the corporate sector or, or who are familiar with it um, and also have military uh, background can certainly help, um, help you do that. You know, I think from the hiring person's perspective, from the, from the other side of the table, um, you know, what uh, it, it's in the military, you're not, you typically aren't, uh, you don't self-promote. Um, that's not part of the culture. 
the culture there is working as a team, uh, work doing everything, succeeding or failing together. It's not about the individual. Um, however, uh, when you're interviewing and you're, and you're sitting across the table from another individual who's the hiring manager, it is about you, and, and you have to self-promote. And so if you have to, and it's, it's hard to do after you've been in the military for even a couple of years because they, they really pound that into you from the, from the moment you start, uh, but you have to be comfortable, as comfortable as you can, really talking yourself up and being your own cheer, cheerleader and being your own uh, biggest promoter. Uh, because that's what's expected of you in that particular situation. And so, you know, I would say from the core pers perspective, and one of the things that we've been doing, and we've been trying to educate our folks, our hiring managers, our, our HR team internally at Moody's over the past year, um, is to understand that when you do have a military, someone that's been in the military and that doesn't have a corporate experience, civilian experience, um, help make it a little easier for them. Just understand that that's the mentality that they have and that's the angle that they're going to take. Um, so do what you can to try to tease out uh, from them, their accomplishments, and what they've done individually, and focus a little bit less on kind of the team missions and the team objectives and the team goals. Okay, thank you. John, would you like to add to that in any way of some of the things that you've seen? Yeah, thank you. I'd, I'd love to add to that. I struggled, I struggled with that myself as well, coming from a culture um, in the Navy SEALs where we were very much told to keep quiet what you did, right? It's just silent pride, silent humility, and it took me a very long time to be able to translate my skills, translate what I could actually do. On the employer side, I guess I can, you know, expand a little bit more on, on that. Table stakes for a veteran, we would, what you would typically see or hope to see it would be a bit of professionalism, somebody who shows up looking very good, um, integrity, their appearance, confidence, all those things the military kind of keep, teach you, and that's, that's table stakes. But what they will have difficulty translating are some of the team development skills that they have. Um, they're going to have uh, their communication skills are exceptional and yet they're not gonna be able to communicate that perfectly, right? And that's, that's an important differentiation. Um, their flexibility and adapti adaptability to situations is absolutely huge. Uh, you're looking at folks who, are, who have been through a lot more than we would ask normal um, executives or, or normal any, anybody in the workforce that you're looking for. Um, I think probably most importantly, their mission focus and their clarity of purpose. right? So as they come in, they're really gonna look at what you need them to do or what they can actually give into the company. So I think those those are the skills that are most um, prevalent. They're coming in. They're coming in the door. But uh, you know, as as, um, as Steve was saying, it, it is something that's difficult to do on the onset. You're going to have to break down some of those barriers. They're going to have a lot of acronyms in their resumes. They're going to have a lot of military speak. They might come in looking a little bit rigid, right? And you're going to have to kind of t tease that out. It's a good good way to put tease that out. And say, hey, just relax. You know, we're here to kind of have a conversation. That's going to help. That's going to help them open up. Mm. Yeah. Just, just to touch on that point, Jack, because I think that's a, that's a very good one as well. And that is another thing about the military is it's very much, by, obviously, by definition, very rank-focused, right? And when, as a, as a, as a soldier, sailor, airman, when you're uh, talking to someone that is in a position of authority or that you perceive to be in a position of authority, you're inclined to talk less about yourself just, just by the nature of how you've kind of grown up through that system. Um, and so... Uh, from the corporate hiring perspective, you should, un I, you know, there's another, another point I talked to the hiring managers, but you should understand that um, and do your best to, to make them feel at ease to, so they understand, you know, this is not, you know, speak freely. You know, you can drop the surge, you can drop the ma'am. Just try to make them as comfortable as they can uh, to talk about themselves. And, you know, it's oftentimes when you get people that have been in that environment for so long that when a, a, a superior is talking to them, they're standing at attention, it's very difficult for them to just to walk into a room uh, with a big gregarious laugh and smile and, you know, and be really warm to that person on the other side of the table. So just, you know, I think that's why it's incumbent on corporate America to just understand where they're coming from. It doesn't mean that they can't do it, but they're just not used to that, right? And so you have to, you have to kind of work with them a little bit at the outset. Okay, well, thank you for that. And I think, you know, Alpha is an, another example of, you know, learning different cultures and sharing in different cultures. Uh, just like being in the military, people have different backgrounds and you have to understand what that is and how you can bring that to the table. So that was terrific. Thank you. Now, obviously, as we are trying to hire folks and have different initiatives, Will, maybe you could talk about some of the things that are happening at Comcast um, and what you, what's happening in that particular space. Sure. So uh, when it comes to hiring uh, veterans, one of the questions that companies that are new to the space uh, have is, so where do I find them, right? They're you know, less than 2% of the population. I've heard I should hire them. I believe what I've heard in terms of the attributes that they bring uh, to the company. 
Uh, so you, I've made the case. I've uh, you know aligned folks. I have some budget, or I have some folks that are focused on this. You know, where do I find uh, military candidates? So we at Comcast NBC spend a lot of time uh, working multiple avenues. Um, it's everything from physical job fairs, some of which are uh, free of cost. Um, U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation's Hiring Our Heroes runs over uh, uh, 200 job fairs in uh, locations around the country every year uh, of no cost to job seekers, and most of them no cost to employers. Excellent way to find uh, veterans in transitioning military. We also participate in virtual job fairs so that we can reach uh, currently serving uh, service members who are still in the military and perhaps working overseas or deployed aboard a ship. Uh, we work with military bases that are in our footprints uh, across the country. We're in over 40 uh, of 50 states uh, uh, on the Comcast cable side, and so working with uh, military bases in general and then those that have particular specialties that are most relevant uh, uh, to the kind of jobs that we hire. So if we're looking for technical skills, communication skills, fiber optics, networking, um, we'll look at Fort Gordon, Georgia, which is the home of the Army Signal Corps, as a, as a logical place to uh, look for candidates uh, for that. Uh, we have an active uh, veterans network uh, employee resource group. So there is a built-in group of folks with connections uh, to the military. Uh, and so we're eagerly uh, and actively uh, soliciting uh, referrals. Um, advertising is something that, uh, uh, you know, print media still counts a bit in this space because many times uh, military folks are handed a magazine, whether it's GI Jobs, whether it's US Veterans Magazine that you have in front of you. Uh, you know, these are uh, places that vets sometimes go to find out what military-friendly companies are there, uh, and so we work to, uh, to, to put our brand uh, forward there. Uh, and then, of course, it's being uh, part of building our overall brand as a military-friendly uh, company and then reinforcing that through social media, through telling the story of vets who are successful at our company, uh, and, uh, you know, in, ensuring that uh, we're able to articulate our value proposition uh, to veterans and generate that positive word of mouth. Terrific. So, George, so now we've talked a little bit about uh, the folks and uh, the backgrounds. We've talked about some of the initiatives that are out there, but clearly there's some um, sometimes designed to find to be obstacles or transition issues that are faced by some of these military vets. Tell us a little bit about that and what are the things that uh, can be helpful to overcome some of that. Well, we touched upon that, and I think Steve and, and, and Jonathan really, you know, hit the hail and, and nail on the head. Uh, the J.P. Morgan approach was very uh, organic, and, and, and you know, we, we reached out to the network groups of our veterans, and we really kind of vetted out their experiences and, and hardships that they went through. As a result of that, we went and leveraged partnerships with many areas as to answer Will's question, where do you find them? We build partnerships with uh, either the bases, the post, or the naval stations, and contacted their separation offices. That's the first place any serviceman will go as they transition out, the separation office. Uh, we went through the universities and, and colleges and contacted the veterans office. That's the next step where veterans go when they're pursuing that higher education. And we also reached out to all the communities, whether they were uh, uh, any group, veterans organizations, we reached out to them and let them know what we were trying to do and what our hopes was to engage folks. After we did that, we experienced the second challenge, which is, again, what we touched upon. We did not speak the same language. And that's a mutually owned issue, both from the departing servicemen and for the employer. And, and if you look at the skill sets that a prior service member will communicate to you, to the normal civilian employer, they will not know what to make of it because they don't understand the, the fundamentals that that job provides. Uh, at J.P. Morgan, we recognized that, and we again went to the veterans group and prepared manuals to teach the managers to understand each of these services. How does it work? What is the organizational components? What are their missions? What are their ranks? What are their key words? Help us understand the terminology. So managers, as a result of that, when they would engage these uh, ex -prior, uh, their prior servicemen, they would understand. They had commonality and they had a very good understanding of what you did, why, and what core skill sets you can bring to the firm. Mm -hmm. Later on, of course, the last hurdle was the transition. And to this day, to Stephen's point, I still refer to people as yes sir, no sir, until you break down. Uh, you know, the, that's a, a DNA cultural thing that you're just, you know, in, in, indelible mark is left on you to that. And, 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 and you really respect authority. Uh, one of the issues I hope we touch later on is how prior service members really have a challenge distinguishing themselves because you're told to be humble. 
hard work will get you recognized. That's what you're told. And as a result of that, we underestimate the value of networking. Prior to that, my service, my education, my skill sets, my functions, I wore those. You could tell by my rank where I am in the pecking order. You could tell my skill sets by the patches or badges I wear. And you could tell where you are in that pecking order and what your responsibilities. We need to train them to know that it's okay to go to the managing director. It's okay to go to the vice president and share your ideas and be vocal. So in short, I think veterans have a lot of hurdles, but I think the important part is we're beginning to dissect those, understand them, and provide solutions. Thank you, John. I see you nodding your head quite a bit there, so maybe you'd like to add to that a little bit. Yeah, I think it's I think the great points. I think it's uh, it's right on board. Talking specifically to each of your companies and what you're trying to do and how you how you set up. One of the things that PNC has been very successful with is our employee uh, business resource group. As I said, we're a little bit farther along. We've doubled in size over the past two years, and we've been able to uh, facilitate the onboarding a little bit better. Uh, we we did not have it right initially. Uh, it took some time to look at military resumes, read them, and actually be able to translate them to where they should be at your companies. Um, looking at those skill sets, they don't translate perfectly. Um, so we have a we've set up a, our own military uh, employee business resource group as well as our military recruiters for us that we can then get those. It's a virtual uh, group, so we have no location where we meet, but we can get and shoot those resumes to a few select individuals who will then be able to translate them and translate them easily. We've also set up market champions in each of our markets to, to help read those resumes and uh, as go-to people. Um, one of the things I think each company could do is set up mentorship programs. I think it's extremely important uh, to reach out inside your companies to have both military and non-military non -military mentors. That is extremely helpful to mentors come, to um, service members coming in. Because again, they're coming from a different culture. They don't fully understand the organization that they're coming into. They have a lot to give, and they just don't know how to translate that yet. And as they get in, having somebody outside of what they would call their chain of command, and I'm still stuck in the same, right? Uh, having somebody in their chain of command makes it very difficult for them to speak to, because it's either up or it's down. And that's how, that's how their, their mind thinks about it. Um, having that mentor outside of their chain of command, having that mentor outside of their line of business, extremely helpful to them, uh, especially in the first six months of the transition of coming in. It's going to help you significantly with retention. I like to think a lot about um, using a Navy analogy between two Army guys here is, uh, is a, ship out, a ship out at sea. Uh, one of our aircraft carriers you know, takes about 5,000 people. And on that ship, you have every skill you can possibly imagine. You, it's a virtually a floating city, and you need everybody to do everything on that ship. It has to survive. You have supply officers, you have cooks, you have finance guys, you have, um, you have pilots, you have SEALs, you, everything is on there. So in that, if you think about that, you have the full buffet of skills that you need. We just have to be able to help, help those folks come back and be able to translate those over. Thanks. Now, Will, you obviously have a lot of hiring initiatives. Maybe you could talk about some of those uh, obstacles and transition opportunities. Well, part of it is, uh, you know, you need someone to give you that first chance and that first opportunity. Um, you know, I, I still remember very clearly, uh, you know, trying to make my case for why I would be a good hire uh, as I was transitioning out of the military. It's really a, a key moment. Um, but I think one of the things that's important to point to is how do veterans perform once they're at the company. They've been given that moment. Uh, you've created the right uh, atmosphere where hiring managers are attuned to reading the skills. They uh, are actively seeking military. So how do they perform? And I think that's been an important part of uh, the equation at Comcast NBC. We do a um, yearly employee opinion survey where we uh, survey everyone in the company. Uh, and then we demographically break it out so that we can look at different groups. Uh, we did that with veterans. Uh, and it told us three important things. Um, one, veterans on balance are happier and more engaged than the population at large. I will say our scores are generally high across the board, uh, but in particular, uh, when you look at uh, the veteran community, a statistically significant increase. Um, they also have a statistically significant higher retention rate, so they stay longer. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, score uh, significantly higher when it comes to dealing with stress, ambiguity, and change. Uh, so that's one aspect that I think is common to all branches and fields of the military is 
ambiguity and adaptability. Uh, you know, one of the phrases is um, improvise, adapt, and overcome. Uh, critical in corporate America, critical in the military, and a, a skill set that, uh, that carries over. Uh, so if you can go to a hiring manager and say, how would you like to hire a population of employees that um, are going to be happier, uh, they're going to work harder, uh, they're going to stay longer, uh, and they're better at dealing with uh, ambiguity, stress, and change. Would you be interested in perhaps overweighting in that population? Oh, and by the way, they're statistically um, higher in the number of persons of color, uh, so it aligns well with our uh, corporate uh, diversity initiative. Uh, and uh, you know, it, it's the right thing to do for some of the reasons that uh, we touched on as a leading American company. There's a national dialogue on hiring veterans, and, and this is an opportunity for us to participate there. So I would bet that the answer in your company will be the same that it is in our company. I'll take as many as we can find, right? Go out there and find them. Uh, and so I think um, for veterans, it's a question of finding the companies that understand that. It's uh, uh, you know relatively easy to understand the organizations that uh, have made a commitment to this. Uh, I would venture to say, let's start with the companies that are at this table, right? Uh, would be a, would be a great place uh, to start, um, but I think for veterans getting out, you know, do your homework, understand what you bring. Don't go in from the sense of they need to do me a favor. Understand your value proposition at these companies that uh, that understand it, and I think you'll have a leg up. Well, thanks for that. Now, now, Stephen, prior to the current role I have today, I was the firm's global head of recruiting, and one of the things I suffered with sometimes um, in the interview process at Goldman was. How do hiring managers understand what they're looking at, who they're talking to? What advice would you have for creating for a more positive interview process? Yeah, I mean, I think this goes back to a little bit of what we touched on earlier, um, and that's you know working with wh whomever the hiring manager is going to be, so whoever's going to be in the room uh, with that military veteran, uh, talking to them one on one, have someone prior to that conversation um, coach them up and, and, and teach them what they need to know. Uh, at, at a minimum about this individual's resume. So one of the initiatives that, uh, that we're looking to start at Moody's is partnering with our veterans ERG, of which we have, I think, 100 plus in, in the year that we've been around, which is, which is great. Uh, partnering someone from, with military experience with the veterans ERG with HR. So every time we have a, a resume come in and it, and it rises to the level where we're gonna interview that person, um, HR will reach out to us uh, the veterans ERG and, and have a conversation, right? And so we'll have one of our military veterans at Moody's take a look at that, and you know we know because um, we serve, so we know which are what are good jobs, what's what's a normal trajectory that this person should have followed, um, so we can help explain that to that person before they go into that room. I think the worst thing you can do is to have someone that has zero understanding about the military, doesn't understand the, the acronyms, doesn't understand the background, doesn't understand the rank structure, um, go in and, and talk to this person and to really try to understand their background because the, 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 frankly they can't. Um, without having a l at least a little bit of education. So while it's not practicable to have a military veteran um, do every single interview and every single screening with a, with a military person, I think, I think it is possible at least to have a little bit of a contact with whomever is going to have that conversation prior to them having that conversation. Just have a little bit of a coach up, five, ten minutes, whatever it takes, um, whatever's available, um, so they at least uh, are going in there with the right perspective of what this person was doing in the military, uh, what skills they have, and really kind of what level they, sh they should be, and so they can ask questions appropriately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I do recall, even my own firm, as we talk about stress, um, I do remember in 9-11 when one of my responsibilities was gathering people and making sure we get out of the building and get safe to ferries. Uh, I had had an initiative a few years earlier of hiring some military vets. And while we were all running to the ferries, these 12 individuals were running toward the situation. It was a very unique situation. So regarding handling stress, and if people talk about Wall Street is often stressful, they could handle it much better than we could, obviously. Um, so with that, let me, let, me, let me turn it over to George and, and, and ask a little bit about some of the gaps. You know, we've all, as firms, have done some terrific things, and many other firms are trying to get into the space, but gaps still exist. Uh, tell us a little bit about the gaps and the opportunities that are out there for firms like ours as well, the firms that are trying to get into this at some point. Uh, uh, and I'll speak, uh, uh, you know, in my experience with J.P. Morgan, and, and I think it's all shared as we hear the comments. I think it's, you know, it's a common theme, right? We hear the same drumbeat or the same challenges in uh, some of the solutions we have. I think we fully do not understand um, all the values that a military member can bring in specific skill sets. Uh, that said, I think if you look at the performance of veterans, well, just you know, really wrapped it up very well. 
The question is how to find the right jobs uh, for, for the veterans. And by that, I mean at the end of the day, you're interviewing for a job because it's a symbiotic relationship. They need resource and they need talent and you need a positive income. Well, that's, that's really it, right? So when you find, and that's you know the transaction at, at its most basic core, what you need to do is have that transaction really becomes transformational. And what you need to do is really, as a firm, all firms, is look at their skill sets and say, I understand you're trying to transition. Where do you bring the best value? And I think if you look at all the service members, there are certain things in their DNA they will bring in, I mean, without saying, structure, discipline, uh, loyalty, uh, ability to really withstand uh, some of the pressures that uh, a normal employee may not have the ability to after the environment they've served. Uh, over time is, you want me to work three, four, five hours, you know, at the end of the month, every cycle, that's not a problem. What we need to do as corporations is better understand their needs, their financial and educational needs, and support those. As I said, a lot of veterans leave. They use the service as a springboard for higher education. And I think all firms on this panel have great benefits to that continuing edu uh, education. I think we need to look and say, what specifically can we do for the veteran population to continue that? Because you have a great core of, of people. How could you make those further developed to bring more value? Mm -hmm. Totally agree. I, uh, yeah, sure, add please, something well. to that because I think um, you know when I think about gaps uh, there's a couple of critical ones out there and, and ones that we're still working at Comcast NBC to address um, so it's not equal across all populations of veterans right um, and it's a it's a very dynamic environment you have everything from senior transitioning military officers uh, leaving after 20 years or NCOs leaving after a full career uh, all the way to first-termers that are getting out after four years or five years, been deployed uh, in war zones the majority of that time. Subpopulations, disabled veterans, female veterans, you've got military families, spouses, um, they're all part of the uh, equation as well. Uh, so if you look at, uh, you know, the unemployment numbers, um, actually for veterans as a whole, it's uh, comparable if not better than the population is large, at large when it comes to unemployment. But for female veterans, that's not the case. Uh, significant area of opportunity there. Uh, the VA system has not been set up to support always females in the same way that it has historically uh, been set up to support male service members. The VA, as we all know, has challenges regardless of whether you're, you're male or female. Uh, female veterans are less likely to declare as veterans, right? And that's part of the battle. How do you find them? How do you know you have them in your company or seek them if they're not um, actively declaring? Disabled veterans is another one of those categories. In, in general, with people with disabilities, um, it's an area where unemployment uh, rates are higher and it's no different uh, for veterans. And then military spouses, how do you work with portability issues when you can guarantee jobs when they move? Uh, to a different area uh, of, the, of the country or overseas or military family members. So I think these are some unique areas that we're putting some emphasis and thought behind. Uh, we're using things like uh, the 100,000 Hire Coalition that uh, JP Morgan uh, sponsors to try to work through some of those and come up with uh, best practices. But in general, even the best uh, companies at this uh, have opportunity in those spaces. OK, thank you. Um, why don't we keep the you know, keep the microphone down there. I'd like to ask a question of each of you. Since we're here at the Alpha Conference, obviously, tell us a little bit about how you think Alpha could be helpful uh, in the process overall. Hugely. Um, I had the opportunity um, to listen to Charlie's vision for Alpha, uh, increasing the membership, uh, you know, in, in investing in the organization. But one of the things uh, really struck me, uh, and it, it really transcended the traditional metrics that you'd think of a and leaders. Uh, looking at the demographics, seeing the growth in the Latino population, what are some of the things that this organization can do to prepare that next generation to lead uh, so that we can continue to maintain uh, you know, our status as the preeminent uh, nation in the world? while wow, very ambitious, right, and, and very important. And who better than to have veterans as part of that uh, mission? I mentioned the uh, large population of Latinos within the military. 
uh, you know, we look at our numbers and about 16% of our veteran hires um, represent uh, Latinos. So we're very proud of that. We're trying to expand that. And so this is a organization that fosters the transition of that segment of the population into an organization like this. You can prepare them to lead in the future, can connect them to the kind of world-class companies that are sitting in that career fair hall about to talk to the membership is a, uh, is a unique opportunity. To have the kind of voice that this organization and access to corporate leaders, uh, making uh, veteran uh, employment and support issues a panel discussion. Uh, this is the first time that I've been involved in a panel at one of these type events and seeing a whole organization come behind it and one of only, I think, three or four sessions that's being televised. That tells me a lot about the respect and recognition for this community that this organization puts on that. So I think uh, it's a natural pairing uh, and one that'll be uh, long-term uh, successful for Alpha, successful for veterans, and successful for our country. Thank you. Thank you. Paul, if I could just add to that, and you know, uh, yeah. we'll hit right on the numbers. Right now, if you look at the Latino population in the United States, it's 16%. Uh, Roughly, you look at about 50 million. Uh, their representation in the armed forces uh, at the five uh, branches, you're looking at both the United States Marine Corps and the Navy, they are overrepresented, respectively, 17 and 16%. Army, Air Force, Coast Guard, very right behind there on the 16th. So they do represent a slice of our society's fabric. Department of Defense statistic is, by 2050, Latinos will represent approximately 36% of the military, 35%. Alpha is paused to use these folks as a pipeline to leadership. Those relationships we've had with the universities, with the college, with the veterans, uh, uh, organizations in those communities, you're looking at 35% population to bring those in, 35% of the, rec of the recruits uh, from the armed services to be able to get approximately 32% of those into the leadership roles. So I will really believe that Alpha really should have their, on their radar, partnering with these uh, veteran organizations because as the Latino population obviously and the demographics change, uh, you stand to pause and really be in a position to groom the leaders for tomorrow will, will have an effect on your children. John? Yeah, I think just to add a little bit to that, it's, it's, it's absolutely perfect that these two, the Alpha and, and the veteran community, sync up and sync up well. I'd say going back to your companies, going back to what you this is a call to action for veterans. If you really want to differentiate your companies, if you really want to differentiate leadership into the next chapter, whatever that may be for your company, look internally, set up what you can um, to demystify the veteran side of it. I think it's a, it's a very point, there's a big point that we haven't yet touched on is demystifying what veterans are, you know, what, what they are and what they can give to the, to the organization. Um, this is just simply, a, I mean, a simple call to action. I was delighted, this is my first conference and first panel, very delighted to come and see that this is for, for professionals and for business. I've done a lot of work with the students, and I get a lot of eager eyes, a lot of people very squared away. They got the haircut down there looking great. They're fired up, and they're, they're ready to thrive, and they're ready to do it. And this is the first time, the first opportunity I've had a chance to speak to who they're gonna go talk to, right? This is a call to action for you to go back. It's a call to action for you to go back and, and work internally on whatever structural organization that you have. We do a lot of e-learnings, um, set up a module, help everyone understand what this, what this community or culture um, represents. Okay. Yeah, not, not too much to add to that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, other than just to kind of echo. I mean, if the, one of the main goals of this organization's or motto is to build uh, Latino leadership, you're not gonna find better leaders than what you have in the military. And I can speak from experience. I mean, some of the best uh, soldiers and officers I worked with and had the pleasure to serve with were uh, Hispanic, uh, just tremendous. So there's a, there's a huge well of talent there uh, for future leadership within business. Uh, the challenge really for all of us is finding ways um, to get that pipeline going and get those uh, young men and women who have a ton of upward potential and leadership potential uh, integrated successfully into the business world so they can really flourish uh, and really help out, help out our country in, in that way. Okay, I'm just going to ask one final question before we go to the audience. Um, and obviously, different firms are at different places in the hiring process of military folks. Some firms haven't even started in some cases. 
What advice would you give the folks here that are either going to be in a space of they can take the lead in their firm or they can't take the lead, but they need to give advice to either the hiring managers or the head of HR or the head of recruiting? What sentence or two could you tell them to say, let's, let's give it a shot and let's try from the, what angles should we start with? Yeah, well, I mean, I can certainly speak from the perspective of being very early on, early days in terms of our development. As I uh, spoke about, we've only been, um, our veterans uh, outreach or, or group has only been in existence for a year. I mean, listen, I think it's, I think it's as simple as, as dollars and cents. I mean, the, the business world, the for-profit world is, 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 they're there to make a profit. That's why they exist. They're not, uh, they're not part of the government. They're, it's not a nonprofit. Um, and, I, you know, I think military, military veterans have all the tools, have all the building blocks you need um, to have effective business leaders to really improve your organization in every way possible. And I think, I think one of the, one of the big things is, is getting, getting comfort amongst hiring managers, management, HR, whomever it is, um, to look a little bit beyond the here and now in terms of the potential that you're really getting with, with military veterans. And this is one of the things that I know frustrated me when I was looking for my first job out of the Army, is I would look to my left and my right against the folks that I was competing against and know that I was better than, better than them in, in, in myriad ways. But most of those were soft skills, right? Most of that was leadership experience. Most of that was what we've talked about, the ability to handle pressure, to, uh, to be adaptable, to be thrown into a new situation, have to figure it out, but get the mission accomplished, um, to be on time, to, to do all those kind of soft skill things, but it didn't, I couldn't necessarily compete with the guy or the gal to my left who had five years of you know, finance experience prior to going there. So I think it's really convincing the folks at your companies um, that it's a longer term proposition when you're looking at military, uh, when you're looking to bring in military folks. So while they may not hit the ground running as hard as the person to the left or to the right, or that you know, has a little bit more relevant experience, if you roll the tape forward, you look a couple years, not even too far down the road, what the benefits that they're gonna bring to your organization, your corporation, um, to really grow your business and to provide leadership and, and all those things that we've talked about is very real. It's there. It happens. I've seen it. Um, so it's, it's really just getting out there and, and helping to make that case. Jonathan? That's great, Steve. I, I think going to your organizations and, and going after maybe a one or two sentence if you had to, to bring that up, I, I think there's a sense of urgency that we have around this, right? We have all served in different times throughout the military. We've seen the patriotism flow in and flow out of the military. We've seen de-escalation inside the military. We've seen, we've, seen it, we've seen times, unfortunately, in this history where uh, military service wasn't as high as it is right now. So I think there is a great place right now in America that you are able to differentiate your company by actively seeking veterans. And I think each company should set a goal and should go after it. And that's, that's what PNC did. I'm happy to talk to you about that. It's probably way more than we could do in a panel discussion, but if you want to look to me afterwards or, or find me, I'd be happy to hook you into some of our military recruiters and their ability and, and their success. I would take a two-pronged attack, uh, uh, attack on that. One is canvas your own organization. Uh, you would be surprised how many veterans you have right now. Uh, simply, they ha just, uh, they're not there raising their hands and, and pointing that out. Uh, you'd be very surprised. You probably have a very strong, robust population uh, when you start. The second thing is human nature, right? Your first experience is the one that you really analyze and, and draw beliefs and, and kind of set in stone. Therefore, before you start engaging in this endeavor, educate yourself. As we spoke, as employers, learn the organizations, learn what you should be doing in an interview, learn the language. Uh, it will be very, very uh, successful in your experience if you know how to engage. It's, you know, in military terms, know your enemy, know how to engage it. In this case, know your candidate, know how to engage. And the more work you know and the more research you do, the more successful that you know it, it will come out. Uh, I think all the companies here would be more than happy to share their experiences. As I pointed out, J.P. Morgan has a great book for managers on how to educate them. We call it Military 101. Um, and it really makes uh, the managers comfortable. So two things is canvas your organization. Second, become a better employer and educate yourself before engaging that candidate. It'll put him at ease and it'll make, put the manager at ease. Thank you. So um, I would say that uh, I would encourage other organizations to uh, have the same focus that we've had in Comcast NBC, and that's focus on the free. 
Uh, and that's a very important part of our strategy because there's a lot of free resources out there in the veteran recruiting space that a company, no matter how small or how large, can take advantage of. It does not take a lot of capital uh, to get involved in this space and be successful. Uh, the Department of Labor is very uh, active in the space of trying to uh, place uh, veterans in, uh, in transitioning military into career opportunities. They have representatives in every community in the United States eager to look for opportunities to advertise jobs and promote them. Uh, the VA, um, the VFW, all of these organizations uh, that are community-based uh, operate at no cost to, uh, to get veterans uh, interested in your company. There's the free job fairs that I mentioned already a couple of times uh, across the U.S. Forming an ERG to the point you made, identify your veterans, bring them together, brainstorm. Uh, that in and of itself is going to uh, bring a lot of energy and good ideas and uh, commitment and free labor. You'll be amazed at what people will do in terms of, uh, you know, getting out there and trying to make a, make a difference. Uh, have them look at their LinkedIn networks, right? Does it mention their military service? Do you belong to Rally Point, uh, which is a LinkedIn for veterans? Uh, so veterans that have served go on and create a profile. If you're creating a profile there, it means that you're probably pretty into the fact that you served and you're pretty into the fact that people might reach to you and ask if you have any advice or tips of how to get into your organization. Uh, cost nothing. 100,000 Hires Coalition, if you're a larger organization, no fee for that. All of this great information and networking, uh, been able to take advantage of it at, at, at no cost. Uh, so really, if you um, think across the board uh, of not spending money but making an engagement, being vocal in your commitment and energizing your own veterans, you can make uh, an impact here, even if you're a small business of uh, you know less than 100 people uh, or if you're a Fortune 50 uh, like my company. I'll just add another thing from Goldman Sachs' perspective is uh, military recruitment is like a lot of other diversity initiatives. And at the end of the day, while we like to do a lot of nice things for the world, at the end of the day for us, it's about making money. And actually having another avenue for us to make sure we get top talent, it's what it's all about. It really comes down to the bottom line. And I think that's what a lot of firms really want to hear. And if you could bring, bring, bring some green to the bottom line, I think a lot of folks will actually listen to you from another angle. With that, I'd like to give a little applause to the panelists. And now I'd like to open it up for if there's any questions in the audience. So, so the question for uh, those of you that might not have heard was uh, female veterans digging in a little bit more on that topic, uh, some of the things that uh, the companies are doing uh, in that. Uh, so I'll speak for uh, you know some of the things that we're focused on at Comcast NBC, and one is our visual imagery. If we're going to do an advertisement in a national pub publication, and we're going to feature a vet, it's going to be a female vet. Uh, so if you look at our nat national advertising campaign in GI Jobs, uh, female vets are front and center. When we have the opportunity to profile a success story, uh, we're going to overweight in some of the areas that we're most focused on. So post 9-11, disabled veteran, female veteran. Uh, we look at our um, charitable giving from our foundation and try to target that as well. So I mentioned we're supporting the um, uh, veteran wheelchair games uh, next week in Philadelphia. Uh, that's a deliberate uh, statement of support and backing. Uh, we do the same thing uh, with different uh, female vet-focused uh, organizations. Uh, our employee resource group uh, held a panel discussion on female vets in the military, so we gathered uh, seven or eight uh, female veterans from across the enterprise and uh, brought them in for a moderated panel discussion that we broadcast across the country uh, to access for everyone at Comcast NBC was able to, to tune in. And there were really no holds barred in that discussion, everything from Sexual assault, which uh, is a very unfortunate uh, topic and um, reality uh, that, that's uh, uh, you know, plaguing our military and a lot of action around that. Uh, talked about uh, child care and family care concerns, the VA system and how attuned it is to uh, serving female vets. Uh, and so having that kind of authenticity and sponsoring that in a company-sponsored event to say, you know, we're not afraid to talk about this. We're going to put it out there and put the challenges out there. 
um, you know, it motivated our female veterans and our other ERGs. We have the Women's Network, we've got the Young Professionals Group. Uh, you know, we're all united in this. If you're a member of an ERG, we're cross-supporting each other um, across the board. Uh, so having, um, you know, that, that kind of uh, dual messaging helps. But we don't have it solved. Um, you know, we're, it, it's not uh, something uh, that I think you say, all right, we got that check, Fem Female Vets is done. It's a, it's a journey. Um, and we're also focused on sustainability, and I think that's an important point for all of the companies here and this effort in general, right? A lot of focus on it right now with the drawdown in the armed forces, with the withdrawal from Afghanistan, with the um, shrinking of the army. Uh, you know, there's, there's majors and captains who are currently serving in Afghanistan who are giving pink slips and looking to come to the workforce, but this is gonna be an issue and an opportunity 10 years from now, 15 years from now, and so we're focused on trying to build a sustainable model um, and maybe the areas of greatest concern will shift over time, uh, and then we'll be looking at those as our strategy evolves. Thank you. Do we have another question in the audience? Rob. Uh, hi, I'm Robert Barton, a Latina scholar, and I'm the chairman of the National Association of Naval Service Officers. We've been working with the, with the Department of Defense since 2004 on some of these issues. And when we went, um, since for the last three years, we have a, a program of the reintegration and reassimilation of uh, veterans into corporate America. And when we interview within corporate America and we interview the veterans, they found that the greatest stumbling block was the hiring manager that really did not understand who they, who they, who they really are and the, the challenges that they're going to face. There are two things that, you know, that really um, struck me when, when Will was speaking because it's not, not only the issue of hiring them, it's how you retain them. And the retention issue has to, to do a lot with the kind of environment that you provide. But I would like to know how intensive is your, are your efforts to make sure that you're hiring managers that are actually the first line of, of, of contact with the company are reacting to the veterans because we heard everything from the, you know, I don't understand me, that them, they scared me, um, they relate. I mean, for a, we're talking to the, you know, to the veterans. They said, okay, you cannot come in and tell them that you're a sharpshooter and you need a job in corporate America. But on the <laughs> other side, you have the, you have the. We we do in a lot of translation, the, the translation skills for resumes and so on. But translating culture is the most difficult part of all, because if you don't have an environment within, you know how you really make them welcome once they get there and they feel that their back is covered because that's one of the main things. You know, when you're in the military, you know, I got your six is big thing. Uh, in, in corporate America, the corporate culture of, of corporate America sometimes is, is beyond understanding for them. So I would like to know first the education of the hiring manager. Uh, how intensive is that and how you know, aggressive are you at putting managers that are veterans uh, to make sure that they talk to veterans. Let me address it, and, and I'm sure we're all just <laughs> throttling back because we're just biting at the bit to answer that. Uh, I will speak, uh, of course, on behalf of J.P. Morgan. Here's a document we have. Fairly thick, both side printed. That's the education for the managers. It doesn't stop there. Managers are required to take online classes. We have a centralized web-based training method, which is how to work with the military, how to interview veterans. That is available to all the managers, and in certain areas, they're required to take that class. It is graded. It teaches them and complements this document, and I'm holding one of five, which we call the Military 101, on how to learn how to work with veterans. The second phase of how to retain them. We have, I've heard them referred to as employee uh, resource groups, business resource areas, networks, and so forth. I think each of these companies that here at J.P. Morgan Chase, we have the voice of employees that serve, acronym for VETS. These are charters that are in all our main locations. We hold, hold, we hold monthly meetings and we hold the classes for further advancement, whether it's resume writings, whether it's networking, whether it's presentation skills. We look at all the needs holistically of a veteran, 
you're taking someone from a very structured hierarchy class related and you're trying to integrate them to a, a, a less structured environment you simply cannot hire them place them in this environment and allow them to figure it out they won't unlike many other employees they will not feel comfortable being vocal or standing out for help and will just kind of cl become cloistered so therefore keeping them engaged participation and engagement is the way that you help them do that transition so I think at, at JP Morgan we see that and we realize that you have to look at the whole issue we spoke about spouse support male or female the veteran may have uh, someone accompanying them we created the uh, military spouse uh, talent exchange so that when they are being separated from the pace uh, the, the post the base or the naval station they know that they will have you know sometimes affectionately called a, a camp follower but we know that their whole you know other side of the family may also need employment we assist those spouses in finding jobs and opportunities by sharing their skills inside the company the veteran might be a very good fit Possibly their spouse may bring other benefits to the company that they could be hired elsewhere. So it, it is a very structured and robust program to educate managers. But again, I say that the veterans also need to understand the terminology that corporate America is looking for. The sharps, uh, you refer to as the uh, sharpshooter or a sniper. I think the, to me that individual brings incredible intensity, passion, discipline, uh, ability for pressure, and commitment to the job. I'd love to hire him. I'd add just a little bit to the retention side of that. And at you know, PNC, we have the same, same amount of initiatives we've been talking about the whole time, and that is really getting everybody educated quickly um, through the Employee Re Business Resource Group, getting, our, getting the uh, organization set up so as you see a military resume and it makes you a little bit uncomfortable to get that to the right person. But on the retention side, it's important to note that military folks, they've been in the military, maybe they get out before their, co before their commitment, or maybe they don't stay for their career. So I'll speak for like Steve and myself. We pretty motivated, and we signed up at a very young age, 16, 17, 18 years old. We decided we're going to go raise our right hand and do something a little different for the country. At about 25, 26, we were ready to rock, and we were ready to move on. We are very motivated, and we are taking chances, and we are very aggressive at doing that. So coming into our organization, to your point, you're aggressive. You're, if it's happening, if after a couple of years it's not happening, the military mindset is you're about one or two years in a command, and then you're ready to move on again. So that retention is a very, very big deal. Setting up in your company, again, groups, events, things that the veterans can go to. How many of you guys are fired up just to be here and be around like-minded individuals, right? And you feel a little bit, you're gonna go back to your companies later this week and be fired up about going back and this gives you new energy, right? Same thing for veterans. Set up those events, set up those conferences, and then finally get them actively involved in the recruitment process, right? Because that helps bring them in, then they're starting to feel like they're part of a team. Robert, at, at our firm, another thing that helps managers believe that it's important is in addition to the uh, employee resource group uh, and in addition to the programs that we run, all of that reports up to a manager committee partner of Goldman Sachs. So people understand that if somebody at the top is taking this real serious, maybe they should think about taking it serious as well. Now it's not perfect, but at least it shows that it's important in the whole firm. Any other questions? Yeah, hi, I'm Ron Griffin from the Wall Street Warfighters. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you publicly for all your support. Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, everybody who's been helping the Wall Street Warfighters. And again, thank you for your service. Uh, I just want to make a couple of comments. Alpha is something new to me. And what we're have, seeing here today is amazing. My job is to help veterans transition to financial services. Alpha's job is basically the same thing. And as you said, the energy is just unbelievable in this place. And the dynamicism, if that's a real word, but it's just amazing what they're trying to accomplish. And what you're doing is, I guess, uh, holding true to what you're really saying right now, because I've seen it from the other side. You're up here saying what you're trying to do to the veterans. I've seen the veterans have been hired. I've seen the people that have been hired, J.P. Moore. We, we just hired Michael Bell from the Wall Street Warriors, Four Fighters. I don't know about, I know PNC has got hired a couple of people and come. It's, I'm trying to, to, talking to these people also. One of the things that I found out talking to the veterans is that they do not believe what you say. They do not believe that you really care about them. 
Uh, we don't have Maureen on the panel, so I can use this. I picked up a guy the first time in the first class we ever had in Philadelphia in September of 2012, a Marine sniper. Picked him up at the airport to bring him to a location down there. Talked to him for two minutes. I said, what do you think about the program? Well, you're going to house me. You're going to feed me. You're going to clothe me. You're going to give me a stipend. You're going to train me. You're going to get me to pass my Series 7. What's the catch? There's got to be a catch. <coughs> Somewhere in there, there's something wrong that you guys really care. And I've heard so many times, and something <coughs> you can bring into your own thought process, they think it's the checking of the box. Okay, we say nice things about the veterans, check the box, and we move. I know that's not true. I deal with the people all day long. I go to these different places. I go to the Alpha, I mean, I went to an Alpha uh, get together in US Trust, and the people at Bank of America, unbelievable. We've already got two guys hired from the Bank of America for that one visit. Same thing with you guys. I want to say that publicly and, and join Alpha because of what you guys do. And it, it's just an amazing process. Somehow, it's right. And, and they're finally getting it. The guys who are or the veterans are understanding what you guys are doing. Especially, my boss is General Peter Pace. Okay. Mostly officers, okay. We sat there at a board meeting. This is great to understand. We sat at a board meeting, and the guys came in, and they gave their elevator speech. Retired captains, uh, we had pilot. okay. They go out the door. He said to me, are we turning into a finishing school? Where's my stretch candidates? Where's the guy who was an E4 in the Marines, who wants to get into financial services? How is that gonna happen? That's what you guys are doing now. A lot of our recruits are E4s and E5s. I just want to publicly thank you. Well, thank you for that. Uh, one advice I would say to tell anybody is none of these firms that are sitting up here are not for profits. We wouldn't do it if it was just for nice things to do. We're really doing it at the end of the day to improve the bottom line. Is there a question back there? Thank you. I'm glad that the topic of PTSD came up. It was something that I, you know, I think it was, it's good to discuss. It's another one of those demystifiers in the um, veteran community, right? As we look at the veteran community, how many folks would you say, percentage-wise, coming back have PTSD? Rough guess. It's actually five percent. Okay, how much? How many folks in in, in America have uh, have PTSD? <laughs> <laughs> I got double. Um, <laughs> it's actually 3.5% as American population o overall, 3.5% due to heart attacks, maybe some traumatic uh, um, domestic issues that, that, that folks have. The delta there is 1.5%, right? Uh, disability, the disability, um, I'm not sure the, the exact statistic in those coming back with disabilities, but it's, it's pretty low. I don't know if anybody on the panel knows, knows that statistic.
that uh, not everybody coming not everybody coming back, you know, is, is, has has had mental trauma or has a physical disability that they're looking to, um, you know, to find a job. This isn't something we're looking to, you know, hey, can you help me out and find a job? We're really looking to get engaged and really looking to give and continue to serve. Um, uh, as far as resources on on the PTS on the PTSD uh, side, I'd, I'd let somebody else on the panel who might have a little bit more information if anybody wants to volunteer. Um, To that and, and thank you for um, you know raising that topic and, and putting yourself through the emotion of that being it's very um, visceral reaction t uh, to this scenario um, and I think we at Comcast NBC don't see that we necessarily are a resource to solve that problem but we can look at the avenues that we have to, to make a difference and so when we look at our employee assistance provider, which is a service that we provide to all of our employees. If you're having a personal trauma or crisis, you can connect with this firm and they'll get the right kind of counselors for you to help you work through that at no cost. And you know, there's, there's time given at work to address that if you need to. Uh, so when we go through and make our selections on who our provider is, part of our questioning is how capable are you in the space of folks with PTS. Uh, are you aware of the resources, you know, military one source, uh, unique things that the VA have? Are you able to make those connections um, to the professionals that can uh, point people to the help that they need? Uh, and so that's a service that's broadly available for all folks. And, and the point that was made in terms of the numbers of um, veterans with PTS versus the society at large, I work in human resources and wow, the things that you see out there, um, you know, it's, it's very accurate to say that the, the military is not have the corner on the market on this particular situation and, um, you know, understand the, the real numbers. But, you know, it also comes back to the hiring managers and the supportiveness of the workforce uh, around people. Uh, a lot of our veteran hiring goes into areas where there are supervisors and managers that have um, veteran experiences. Uh, we have a video on uh, our career website that uh, talks about a uh, Air Force reservist who was mobilized and he lost a friend in combat in either Iraq or Afghanistan. Had trouble uh, coping with that when he came back uh, and discussed the help that he got from our employee resource group uh, and from our uh, employee assistance uh, counseling. So I, I think that leveraging the avenues that you already have in place and ensuring that they are sensitive and conscious of the unique needs of the military, um, you know, may be a way to look at that in terms of being able to, to have a corporate response. Yes, I'm back. Yeah, I mean, I can, I, can weigh, I can weigh in from my own personal experience. The short answer is yes, they do. Um, there, is, there is some form of outsourcing or outprocessing uh, in every branch of the military to, to those soldiers uh, that, are, that are leaving the service and going to the private sector. Uh, however, uh, and when I went through it back in 2004, it was wholly inadequate. It was a couple of hours in one afternoon. Um, they put you in front of a computer, you put in, you, you know, your last evaluation report, and then they kind of, there's some program that kind of translates that into a resume, but it was, and that was, that was really it. And then they give you a couple of, uh, you know, ideas for potential jobs that your military experience could prepare you for. So I, and, and I'm sure, I hope it's improved in the 10 years uh, since then, but, you know, I, I think there's probably a, still a long way uh, to go and, and that and that is why there is a very large that's part of the reason why there's such a large gap uh, between us up here and the corporations that we represent and um, and those many uh, tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of, of folks that are returning uh, because they're really not prepared for the next step and so that's why we're trying to do what we can um, to make it e as easy as possible I think you have to look at the issue really long term let's look at the last uh, century right so starting with World War II, as these veterans returned, a lot of them found themselves displaced, okay? 
uh, what was the beginning of the first GI Bill, 1944, was scandalous. People did not know how society would accept. They would not know how all these, uh, you know, veterans would, you know, go into universities and what would we become of those establishments and institutes. Well, it turns, uh, you know, it turned out that the GI Bill from the 1944 worked out very well. It gave us some of the greatest leaders, NASA, uh, some of the institutions that allowed us to enjoy the technology and, and comforts of living that we have today, okay? We come into Korea, again, the veterans are returned, uh, no long-term plan of how to reintegrate them into society. We go through Vietnam, I think that is, you know, does not need to be discussed, okay? I think it was a, it was a terrible time during our uh, society that they were, you know, they really went through the worst, okay? We'll go quickly through uh, Urgent Fury, Granada, Lebanon, Panama. We'll go to uh, Desert Storm. Okay, so I'm kind of carbon dating myself there, right? But that's through Desert Storm. There was no plan. Back then, it was really an unusual situation where the reserves and National Guards were called to duty. And until that point, they were referred to as weekend warriors. You did approximately two years of annual training. You did uh, a weekend a month, I believe. And uh, the job may or may not pay you for that salary, okay, for that time off. That was your time, okay? When we went to a desert storm uh, after those uh, uh, reserve components and uh, National Guard components were deployed for over 90 days, they became federal forces, okay? And uh, when we returned again, we did not have a game plan of how to get them back. Most of them lost their jobs, okay? This is the real, uh, this is the first time, the real effort of saying, they're coming out now in, in, in strong. We're looking at a million because of just natural attrition, okay, and reduction in forces. We call them affectionately RIFT, reduction in forces, okay, or on your officer's review uh, report. It is a, a, an evolution, a evolution developing process that we're working with private firms to say, as you onboard them, we need to board them and find them. Because at the end of the day, these veterans who have a higher than usual unemployment rate will be part of your society, your town, your city. And you want to make sure that what you're having is productive citizens who are adding to the fabric and strengthening the fabric of your community and not someone who's becoming a liability. There's missed opportunities if you allow that to happen. Just the, uh, the nomenclature for the current transition is something called uh, transition GPS. Uh, and it used to be called TAP, the Transition Assistance Program. It used to be a day or a day and a half. And it's now you know over a week. It's required and mandatory. Uh, the government is uh, contracted with some outside providers to try to make it as valuable as, pro as possible. It's a work in progress, um, but it is a significant uh, improvement. Um, but, you know, again, when I have the opportunity to talk to veterans, I challenge them to take charge of their own career transition. I mean, nothing that's provided to you from the government is ever fully going to uh, give you uh, all the tools that you need. Um, and so, you know, I work when I talk to active duty audiences to say, you know, get the right magazines, read the right things, subscribe to the right uh, social media outlets, follow the right people on Twitter, look for mentors out there through RallyPoint or LinkedIn. Um, you know, make it your job, make it your quest, and, um, you know, self-educate as well as take advantage of the things and the resources that are out there, which are better, uh, but of course can never be the full answer. I think we have time for one more question. Do we have the last question? Okay. What we've learned through experience is that uh, it's almost uh, 
like the market. It's almost like a competitive market. Each area is different. What the veteran needs in Jacksonville, which is heavily represented by the naval uh, presence there, is very different from what we will see in uh, Fort Bragg, obviously, or Fort Benning. Let me take Benning, right, which we recruit and bring a lot of folks into Atlanta area, so Benning's near that area. You have to look at each piece, and one size does not fit all. The military skills that you would see in the Navy are very different, and there is some overlay from what you may see in the Army or Air Force or Marines. So you don't have one size fits all plan. You have to know your market, just like in a business. At that point, you have to engage those uh, institutions like the students' organizations, veterans' organizations in the universities, the veterans' office at the colleges. They're going through an education process. We're all going. The companies, the armed forces, those schools are going through. And to aggress, you know, and, and the biggest impact would be the individual branches. As someone pointed out, a huge population are in the enlisted. That goes through, you know, from E1 all the way to, the, you know, E8. That's a huge amount of people and volume to deal with. That can only be addressed at your base, at your post, at your naval station. So you have to reach out to those. Uh, J.P. Morgan has over 800 relationships now and still growing. And we know we have a lot of work. As we all know on this panel, we have a lot of work. This is the first time the private sector is engaging with the armed forces to have this done after a century. It's long overdue. So back to the original question, what advice do you have for companies that are not engaged yet? Start, you're missing the quality, you're missing talent, you're missing opportunity. With that, I'd like to thank Mel, um, the panelists, the firm they represent, and Alpha, of course, for giving us the opportunity to chat on something that's really important. Uh, and the one takeaway, and I think you heard it from every person here, at the end of the day, it's about business, and we think it's an important thing to actually help the bottom line. So enjoy the rest of the conference.